herb. Herb is a plant. I mean, herbs are good for everything. Welcome folks, Cannabis TV. Here we are again behind Eugene's school, waiting for people to show up, hoping, praying somebody's gonna care and wanna come down here and kinda help us out, come on and talk about how they feel about things. Uh, I'm Reverend Will I Am Wingate, and we have Dan Couser here, and we're both here. As, uh, Dan's been here much more than I have. I applaud him for his consistency, because I'm flighty. You know, I'm the name like Wingate, I can't plan a whole bunch. So uh, we're here, and right now uh, we have some information that we're going to pass on, maybe talk a little bit about it. Uh, this one here is uh, the editor's corner, and this is uh, police officer speak out. Want to start a fight on police one? No, thanks. That's okay. I get enough fights out here without having to go look for them. This one here is talking about how um, there's three things, three topics that really bother police. One of them is gun control. One of them is police unions. Third one's legalization of marijuana. Gee, do we have anything to say about that? Let's see what they got to say. A couple of months ago, I was sent an interesting email from at least one member I'd never before had contact with. He said that there was an issue brewing related to cops being reprimanded and or fired for voicing their opinion that pot could be legalized, regulated, and taxed with greater efficacy than the present enforcement of its legal prohibition. Further, <coughs> excuse me, he said that this was not limited to public commentary, but was happening for the expression of opinion from one officer to another in private company. You know, the thing is, if you make sense, you really don't expect things to work in this world. Okay, for instance, the fact that if you made marijuana legal and you used it industrially as well as medically and spiritually, you would have three venues of allowing people to produce product, and to support the product being made by buying it, and it would support your state. But all of the states seem to have forgotten that when we came over here, we didn't come over here as the United States of America. We came over here as individual states and claimed our right to have states' rights. Now, why the federal government feels that they have a right to supersede this is interesting to me because if something is happening intrastate, then they have a right to come in and say, if you're doing it between states, we are paying attention to what you're doing and we're going to make sure you're doing it right. If we're doing it within our own state, back off, get the hell out of our state and leave us alone and quit threatening us like the mafia does with you do it our way or you go down or we're not going to give you money or we're not going to support you or we're not going to build your roads. Hey, man, you know, right now the lousy job you've done of these things to me is uh, not a reason for me to want to support <coughs> you. Uh, the police have a right to express their opinions, but you know what? Most of them don't out of the same thing, fear. They don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to be stuck in the same position forever and ever. So, you know, my take on that is I'd like to see the cops grow some balls and stand up to the people who are making these stupid decisions. For instance, you arrest marijuana. Then you burn marijuana. The only thing that's lost in that process is the patients who could use the burned or vaporized herb to help themselves, mostly medically, some people spiritually. But we don't have a right to do this spiritually at all. As a matter of fact, told by a judge in my court case, that I have a right to my religion, but I don't have a right to practice with my sacrament. My understanding of the separation of church and state is that he didn't have a right to give me permission to do the one, have my own church, 
nor did he have the right to tell me that I couldn't practice with my sacrament. But we don't have any lawyers to stand up on our behalf. And even if we did, we don't have the money to support them because we're busy trying to survive. So if there's anyone out there who has any help in this regard, maybe we can free up the police so they can say what they actually feel and mean instead of something that's given to them on a piece of paper, and that we may be able to get our rights back. Yeah, I'm talking about law enforcement speaking up and ramifications of that. It says here that border patrol agents pursue smugglers one minute and sit around and board them the next. It was during one of the lulls that Brian Gonzalez, a young agent, made some comments to a colleague that cost him his career. <clears throat> Stationed in Deming, New Mexico, Mr. Gonzalez was in his green and white Border Patrol vehicle just a few feet from the international boundary when he pulled up next to a fellow agent to chat about the frustrations of the job. If marijuana were legalized, Mr. Gonzalez <clears throat> acknowledges saying, the drug-related violence across the border in Mexico would cease. He then brought up an organization called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition that favors ending the war on drugs. <clears throat> Those remarks, along with others expressing sympathy for illegal immigrants from Mexico, were passed along to the Border Patrol headquarters in Washington. After an investigation, a termination letter arrived that said Mr. Gonzalez held personal views that were contrary to core characteristics of Border Patrol agents, which are, which are patriotism, dedication, and the esprit, esprit de corps. After its dismissal, Dr. Gonzalez, Mr. Gonzalez joined a group even more exclusive than the Border Patrol, law enforcement officials who have lost their jobs for questioning the war on drugs and for fighting back in the courts. According to that report in the New York Times, Gonzalez has filed a suit in federal court in Texas and is considering pursuing a law degree. So. <laughs> See, to me that's awesome. That's just like uh, running across well, Michael James, for those of you who don't know, here in Oregon. He's our running back and he's an awesome man. Uh, to talk to him, he is uh, studying criminology in school. And I was saying it would be really nice to have people like himself out there because I believe that he's open enough that when we do have these kind of discussions that he's not going to have all of this preset um, input that's going to cause him not to really listen and to care about what's going on with people. <clears throat> So I'm sorry about this man, but I'm really happy. I mean, to me, that's, this guy standing up and going to court, to me, is what I wished Michael Phelps would have done when he was oh, accused yeah. of relaxing yeah. by smoking a bong. And I wish he would have just stood up and said, excuse me, when you have eight gold medals, then you come back and talk to me about relaxing, okay? Because this is the one thing that helps me to relax. And I don't feel it's illegal, and I don't feel that I should be punished by doing the one thing that really helps me to relax my body. Remember, we read that letter on the show, mm -hmm. the letter that Michael Phillips should have written. Right, right. <laughs> Just basically, you know, folks, understand, to me, the Attorney General is the key in each and every state. He is supposed to be the person who interprets the law. He is supposed to be the person who enforces the law and sets up how it's going to happen. So for me, one of the things, like with this man talking about what's going on, not being able to express himself, I've gone to the police chief before and tried to talk to him about having herb when it's arrested go to a common place where we as people can come and we can have it tested so we don't have to worry about something being in there that comes out that's going to be detrimental to people's health. What we can do is take that and then in all the places where we have grows that fail and when a person is starting out because the people of the state said, get the medical patients their medicine. And the state has never done one thing to help us get our medicine. They have done everything they can to control it. They have done all that they can to make sure that we're numbered, basically identified, so that if they ever need to come after all the people who smoke pot for being such free thinkers that they have to stop us. Um, you know, they have us on registry, and that's one of the reasons that some of the people out there actually have to sell herb to other people, mainly because there's people who don't want to be on a list with our government because they don't trust the government, whether it's out of fear or it's out of recognition that the government's out of control and not accountable for their actions. That's whether or not it's here in this city or it's in the state or county or federal. 
federal can't even explain to you why marijuana is illegal, except, well, it was illegal in 1937, and then we, then we did it again in 1970-something or other, you know, and now we have industrial here in this state, but we can't grow it because you have to have a tax stamp in order to be able to grow because you have to have a sample, and you can't get the sample without having the tax act. Hello, anybody else listening to the Catch-22 out there? Because, man, to me, it's pretty nuts, though. Do you suffer from fear of losing your election? Are you terrified that voters will discover you've done nothing to improve their lives? Maybe it's time you talk to your spin doctor about Incarcerex. In clinical trials, Incarcerex has been shown effective at reducing election-related anxieties by making voters think you're doing something about the drug problem. It's simplistic and fast-acting. If your problems continue or get worse, you can always double or triple your dose of Incarcerex. Whether it's addiction, therapeutic use, or just casual use, there's an Incarcerex plan for every American. Best of all, taxpayers, not you, will foot the bill. So talk to your spin doctor about Incarcerex today. Common side effects include loss of civil liberties, police corruption, racial injustice, increased terrorism, spread of HIV and AIDS, and violent crime. Bloated prisons are also a common side effects. Stop taking Incarcerex if bloating lasts longer than 20 years. If you're trying to balance the budget, keep families together, or protect human rights, Incarcerex may not be right for you. Do not mix Incarcerex with the Constitution or common sense. So start taking Incarcerex and keep pretending you're doing something about the drug problem. Even then in Arizona, we got this mess down there. And Arizona finally passed their medical marijuana law. They uh, had a law passed, and they, they passed it before, years ago, and I forgot what happened. But anyway, they finally <clears throat> passed it again, and, and uh, now Governor Jan Brewer, who is a Republican, by the way, surprise, <laughs> uh, decided Wednesday to ask a federal judge to throw out a central component of the state's voter-approved medical marijuana law. The decision came just two days after a federal judge threatened to dismiss Brewer's lawsuit seeking clarity about medical marijuana regulations if the state did not take a position on whether it can implement the law despite federal statute or whether federal law preempts it. <clears throat> Gubernatorial press aide Matthew Benson told Capital Media Services that Brewer is now taking the position that federal law preempts a position in the law that requires the state to regulate and permit more than 100 medical marijuana dispensaries. The state will ask U.S. Judge Court, <clears throat> U.S. District Court Judge Susan Bolton to rule that Arizona cannot process dispensary applications. <clears throat> she does not support the will of the voters, Benson said. Oh, she does support the will of the voters, Benson said, even though she opposed last year's successful initiative. But she also has to look out for the well-being of her state employees. No state employee should be put in a position where they could face federal prosecution simply for doing their jobs. <clears throat> Joe Uhas, spokesman for the Arizona Medical Marijuana Association, which led last year's campaign, slammed the governor's decision. That's unfortunate, he told Capital Media Services. I also think it's somewhat ironic that a state government that seems to be continuously uh, it seems to continuously question federal preemption, preemption, preemption whether it's health care or immigration, now runs behind the shield in an effort to thwart the, thwart the will of the voters. There we are. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> That's, uh, and this is, uh, <clears throat> and this is, the law is, was approved by voters, only allowed patients or caregivers to grow their own if they were located more than 25 miles for a dispensary. But if Arizona ends up with no dispensaries, any patient could grow his own. <laughs> so there's a little. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> basically what she's saying there about the state not being, not wanting to have their workers in that position, what about the doctors? I mean, this goes right back to Dr. Levesque, who lost his license because he said to the federal government, I am not afraid of you. I love that man, he is my hero. Yep. If you don't know who he is, understand he's a person who took all the hits Look it from up the Go government, from the media. Look at Google it. Google it. Philip, Google it. Philip Levesque, L-E-V-Q-U-E, Levesque. Right. 
Um, we love yep. that man because here, I mean, the government said it in its own way. Well, Philip Levick, you can't be doing that. You're taking all these patients and you're giving them medical cards because they say they need medical marijuana. Excuse me, what's a doctor's position supposed to be? But to listen to his patient who is telling him what his problems are or her problems and ask for help, ask for relief, ask for a better quality of life. So here you put all these doctors who are going, gee, I'd really like to help you, but I can't help you because if I do, then I might have to deal with the federal government. The feds, pay attention to what you're doing, okay? You're running our government into the ground. We don't have our schools going on now. In 91, I offered this state $100 off the top of every ounce that was grown in this state if they would make it legal. Do you think our schools would be hurting like they are right now if we would have done that? That's just one aspect of this. And then if we would have made it so that we can industrially take care of all the businesses that support marijuana, the ones who grow food, the ones who grow it for food, the ones who grow it for clothing and for um, everything, basically. And as a medicine and as a spiritual medicine, those things have never ever been able to be as thoroughly investigated and researched as we could because the federal government stands there and goes, well, we gave these people medical marijuana cards. They have federal medical marijuana cards. We even have a school that's growing marijuana that we can get to these patients, even though the patients don't want that marijuana because it sucks. Understand, you have to have some love involved when you're growing your plants in order for you to get the most out of them. And you're not going to find it in a school. You're not going to find it where these people are doing the research on just the specifics of the plant itself. And yeah, that's how we found out about cannabinoids, and the cannabinoids have been awesome for us. <coughs> because yeah. we're finding all the different uses, and that's just great. But what would we have done if people hadn't done the research without permission? Uh, also, I wanted to have you speak on uh, the Occupy movement and cannabis and how things go in Eugene and any ties between that. <laughs> Well, the whole thing is that the people in the Occupy Zone really don't want uh, marijuana there because it brings confusion, just like so many other agencies. I can't mentor children because I will not not admit that I smoke pot. Okay, to me, I also can't drive the VA um, transport to Roseburg or to Portland because I will not not tell them that I smoke pot. I have been driving people and doing service for people for 30 years in this community. Look at my driving record. I have absolutely no problem with that. And the fact that I believe that I'm a safer driver, not always, but no one is 100% of the time, but most of the time because I go slower and I pay more attention to what's going on on the road when I am in a different state of consciousness, one of awareness which you as a police officer or somebody who's in drug counseling will never understand because most people don't do just marijuana. It's marijuana and alcohol. It's marijuana and alcohol and cigarettes. It's marijuana, alcohol, cigarettes, and prescription drugs. Excuse me, I don't drink, I don't smoke. All I do is herb. There's my smoke, that's my medicine. And I'm real clear about it when I use it. I'm real clear about how I act when I use it. And if I'm ever in an inebriated state, you won't see me driving a car. So, I mean, if people were more accountable for their actions, we could definitely make a difference. And then maybe we could hold the government accountable for their actions, because that's the biggest problem we have right now, speaking out of the side of your mouth. Like requiring drug testing, but these people that tell you you have to take a drug test don't have to take it. Exactly. God, I love that in Congress. And then the same thing with the University of Oregon. All you people who work there, you can get pissed off at me. I don't give a shit. Understand this. So if you get hired straight on by the University of Oregon, you don't have to do a drug test. If you get hired by the agencies that hook you up with the university, like doing cleaning and other things like that, you have to be drug tested. There is no consistency, there is no ethics involved in a process when you have a university that has diversion programs for alcohol, for meth, for heroin, for prescription drugs, 
But by God, if you're smoking pot, you're fired. No diversion, <clears throat> no nothing. You are fired. By the way, I was in a local dollar store. I didn't want to acknowledge the name of them just to give them any more <laughs> business. But believe it or not, they have a marijuana drug test in the dollar store for one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that's a new one on me. Me too. I couldn't believe it. One dollar for a drug test. And it advertised it on the package. It was 90, I think they advertised 97% uh, accuracy. Hmm. Nice. The ones that I've always heard about were 99% accurate, you know, and even then, that, that I've always said, well, how would you like to be that 1% that gets the false positive and loses your job and maybe your career? Yeah. <clears throat> how would you feel about that? you feel great testing is okay? <laughs> well, <clears throat> because if you think about it, 99%, that means out of what, out of 1,000, and <clears throat> uh, what's that, 1? 1%. 1%, <clears throat> 1%, yeah, 1%, which is uh, 10. Ten. Ten, yeah. So the ten people has a risk of losing their job and or, and or their career from a false positive drug test. But then, uh oh, that's all right. That's it's worth the risk See, <laughs> for public safety. <laughs> right. Do you folks understand that in our process, we're not supposed to work, we're not supposed to drive, and we're supposed to stay at home. Now, do you know anyone else that has a prescription medication or a recommendation? Because see, we can't even have the medicine prescribed for us. It has to be recommended for us because they are so finite about drawing lines in the sand of how we're supposed to exist and how we're supposed to do things. Now, for all you vets coming back, any of you have PTSD, I would really like you to consider vaporizing, for one thing, herb or eating it to help your body relax and to help your mind relax so that maybe you can forget some of the things that you'd like to. The Israel Army is on. actually using it as part of their program for their vets. They have been for a while now, right? Mm -hmm. I know that mm -hmm. they were studying. I didn't know they were actually using it. But the whole thing is that if this were a plant that were discovered today, the uses of the plant would be astounding and people would be overly impressed tremendously by what it can do. But because of the bad reputation that's been put on it by people who have this process of investment i mean it's just like thinking that you're going to go to your congressman and talk to him and he's actually going to do what you want him to do that's the picture that we're supposed to have in this democracy but i'm sorry that the lobbyists happen to come in and if they have money and they're taking these people out and they're giving them all these things they're impressing them without our best interest at heart so understand we really need to shift the government so that they are accountable to our will because right now it's not happening, hasn't been happening in a long time, and our kids really don't have a lot to look forward to unless we clean this up. By the way, <clears throat> you know the Rick Simpson uh, uh, tincture uh, thing? <clears throat> it's called Run From The Cure, which I always thought was an excellent, excellent title, uh, title for it. Because yep. uh, <clears throat> I always interpret it as meaning running from the cure, meaning that here's an obvious cure for cancer, but we're running away from it because it's illegal. Well, that's the way I interpret it. Well, I heard somebody the other day interpret it a different way, and I thought, wow, that's true. That's an issue. He said that run from the cure, <clears throat> what they're talking about is run away, run from, run from the uh, uh, accepted cure, radiation, chemotherapy, and try cannabis. Right. I well, never thought about it that way. I mean, it means it's kind of like the same thing, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I, when, I, when you have something like, for me and my family, <laughs> my girlfriend had hep C. And she had to go through this hep C regimen, which was really, it's really incredible if you don't know anyone who's ever experienced it. It's really, really harsh. And yet her doctors and the people who are all involved in her process of healing were incredibly impressed by how well she was doing. And she made it a point to let them know, just like my friends who go through the uh, dialysis. You know, I have a friend who's lived 25 years on dialysis, yet most people who are doing dialysis die after two to five years. And he's tried to tell the people straight up that, you know, my thing is that I smoke pot and it helps me. It gives me the desire for eating that I need in order to have the energy I need in order to survive. And it also helps to relax. I mean, if you knew the cramps and the pain and the suffering that people go through and doing, these kind of things that to give them some relief through marijuana is, is a gift. And instead it's looked at as a curse 
and it's only because people believe the lie. Mm. That's the whole thing. People actually care enough to investigate the truth. Like Dan said about Philip Levesque, go on Google, check this man out. To me, the man's a hero. He actually got this thing, this whole ball of wax rolling here in Oregon, and I can never thank him enough for the relief that I get daily from having it as a medicine. Yeah, not only is he a, a, a hero to our medical marijuana movement, but he's a World War II hero also. Yes. I wrote a book on it, uh, something about Dog Day, or I can't remember the dog, so I can't remember the title, but uh, he was at the Battle of the Bulge, uh, and so, I mean, he was right in the thick of it, so he was there. He used to talk about the V rockets, V2 rockets, or whatever they were. He says, that's the only thing that ever really, really scared me, because if I could hear him, I knew I was still alive. <laughs> but on their way, man, it was like, oh my God, here they come. Am I going to make it through this one? So, you know, we have to honor people like that. And to me, I'd like to know if there's doctors out there who care enough to talk about why some of them give up the Hippocratic Oath. You know, because there's differences in belief systems. And so they would rather change the wording of the Hippocratic Oath so it's not so much involved with a better quality of life and uh, it gives them more leeway to do things that may not be as ethical as they should be. All right. <clears throat> yeah, it's always difficult for any doctors to even sign a medical marijuana card because some uh, are afraid of the government, others uh, support it, but the agency they work for won't let them do it. So right, it's, uh, if they're federally connected at all, they immediately say that there's nothing that they can do about it, that they're under federal law, and therefore they can't. I mean, the VA used to do that. Mm -hmm. But Go there ahead. were enough vets who stood up and said, hey, look, you got to do something to change this because you're not allowing me to talk to my doctor. If I can't tell the doctor what uh, I'm doing, then how is he supposed to make an accurate assessment of what's really going on with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's the whole thing, folks. All we're asking is for a different reality, a reality that we can look forward to, that we can give our kids. And that's why we want you to come down here to the theater and see us, you know, and we're going to have people yelling and screaming you over bet. here in the stands. We're going to wrap this up, so I appreciate uh, having Weber and Will in on our show, and uh, uh, happy holidays, uh, and happy, be sure happy. to come down and write on your calendar, 2012, <clears throat> support Eugene Cannabis TV. So, we need right your help. On. Thanks, Dan. You bet. Thanks Take for care. coming. You bet.